speaking on Shakespeare and the pandemic, right? The flyers and the social media posters will follow after the talk. <clears throat> so now, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the yet another version of uh, Department of English Deshbandhu College uh, lecture series. And today we have amongst us Professor Karen Gabriel, and she would be uh, speaking on uh, Charlotte Bronte, Desire and Autonomy in her novels. Before she begins uh, this talk, let me make it uh, a little clearer why we had this talk just before the celebrated Shakespeare's day, because we at the department have been thinking for long to host a day which would celebrate the power of narration and literature of a woman writer. And often it has been seen that 21st of April, which happens to be the birthday of Charlotte Bronte is ignored or overshadowed by the huge presence of Shakespeare two days later. So we thought why not pick up on this occasion and introduce a lecture series, particularly celebrating the power of womanhood in literature. And uh, we are happy that uh, Karen Gabriel readily agreed to uh, speak from this platform. Uh, before I uh, invite Karen for her uh, speech. I would like to give a little introduction about the speaker, although she is very well known. Karen uh, Gabriel Hayes, the Department of English at St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi. She is also the founder director, Center for Gender, Culture and Social Processes at St. Stephen's College. She has published several monographs and articles on issues of gender, sexuality, cinema, representation, Melodrama and the Nation State. These include Melodrama and the Nation, Sexual Economics of Bombay Cinema, 1970 to 2000, and edited volume, Gendered Nation. Her international fellowship and awards include Digital Fellowship 2021 at World Society Foundation and Council for European Studies, CESWSF, at Columbia University, the prestigious European Union's International Incoming Marie Curie Fellowship Scholar in Residence at the College of William and Mary, USA, the Leverhulme Fellowship at UK, 3GXL Postdoctoral Fellowship for Gender Excellence at the Center for Gender Excellence, Linkwing University, Sweden, and the Government of Netherlands Fellowship for Research. So Professor Gabriel today is going to talk about the desire and autonomy in Charlotte Bronte's novel. Welcome, Professor Gabriel and uh, the platform is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shashwat. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when Shashwat told me about uh, the, this proposed um, event, I was really happy because as he says, uh, as the um, woman writer of the stature of Charlotte Bronte is uh, often tends to be ignored uh, because of the a fanfare around Shakespeare, much deserved fanfare around Shakespeare. But I think it's very important also to return to uh, the achievements of uh, someone like Charlotte Bronte, uh, which is, you know, some, some of what I'll try and do. Uh, but I want to sort of uh, today uh, make a few observations by way of understanding how to think of questions of desire, of narrative, sexual fulfillment, moral rigor and female autonomous, uh, autonomy all simultaneously. In the context of course Charlotte, uh, of Charlotte Bronte's writings, which you know uh, is uh, situated during the 19th century Victorian times, which brings its uh, own um, uh, dynamic and uh, uh, complications into uh, an understanding of uh, women writers. And, but also given the fact that there is serious disapprobation around first women's writing per se, when Charlotte Bronte approached um, uh, Robert Southey, who was then poet laureate, and asked him, you know, what she should do with her uh, desire to write, he said, well, it can't be the business of a woman. Uh, so there was around the question of women writing itself, there was a disapprobation and much more around the question of, uh, around an engagement with questions of desire, sexuality, morality, and autonomy. Um, for 
you know, I see uh, um, uh, an ample representation of students. So I just mentioned a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, the manner in which um, Victorian England um, apportioned, if you like, um, relative powers, you know, to the private and to the public sphere and the separation of those spheres that happens at this particular moment. So when, um, you know, there is, and we can take up the implications of this in discussion later, but when there is the question that is raised about women's engagement with uh, the, the notion of desire and sexuality and so on, it becomes, unless it is in the realm of reproductive health, it becomes actually something that we contemporarily call slutty. Uh, or um, something that is uh, inappropriate, something that is then uh, manages to uh, tarnish the speaker as much as it uh, is in itself problematic. Um, but spe specifically with regard to uh, Charlotte Bronte, then regarding questions of sexuality, morality, autonomy, and narrative, I want to begin with her juvenilia. Now, um, I can't cover her, all her novels, but what I can do is make broad arguments that pertain to them uh, and focus on the Juvenilia, Villette and um, uh, Jane Eyre and Jane Eyre because it's you know, such a much loved text and uh, perhaps one of her best known works, even while Villette possibly got uh, more critical acclaim uh, than Jane Eyre. Uh, but specifically with regard to Charlotte Bronte, um, you see that the juvenilia already contains uh, a sort of an incipient but articulated and complicated need for female autonomy within heteronormative sec heterosexual, uh, sorry, sexual relationships. Now, the juvenilia uh, are, returned, uh, are written jointly with her brother Branwell Bronte between 1829 and 1839 but they're published posthumously after, after she dies. And you have, you know, 12 adventurers uh, and other stories, the legends of Angria, five novelettes, the Angrian tales and so on, which constitute this, the, the bulk of this uh, fiction uh, that wore out a pen, as she said, uh, from practice. Um, so, uh, let me just shut the door, please. Um, so the Angrian Tales are a series of individual manuscripts that form then a part of a, a, a complex saga. And you find that it is in the Angrian Tales, which consist of, you know, um, a number of characters, interactions between a number of characters, chief of which uh, Duke of Wellington, Zamorna, and that is, you know, Charlotte's favorite was the Duke of Wellington. Um, and... Uh, their exploits, and their exploits are many and gendered. So there is, you know, this the complex kingdom of Angria within which are located in the West African kingdom, uh, within, within which are located a large number of these characters uh, who are divided, um, um, who, who's uh, along gendered lines, but whose gendered characteristics are then enhanced. So for instance, uh, you have, um, the idea of um, Zamorna, who, or, or you know, later known as Duro, and Lord Duro uh, was, was was one uh, way of referring to Lord um, the Duke of Wellington uh, as a strong sort of wine. Uh, so Lord Duro, uh, you know, who later on comes to be referred to as Zamorna, as he gains in importance in the character, goes more and more Byronic. And he attains this magnetic power over women and his and a familiar attitude toward them. So now uh, Zamorna then begins to replace him, just give you a, a brief idea, begins to replace his father as the final hero of Angria. Now, there are two things. One is that in the early part of the juvenilia, where she co-wrote it with Branwell Bronte, Branwell was very interested in, both Branwell and Charles were very interest, interested in the historical aspects of it. So there was a lot of um, historical detail that was inserted. But then they, slowly there's a shift towards romance. And with the shift towards romance, um, historicity begins to differ, if you like, to romance. And what happens is that with this, 
um, no longer are characters bound by historical constraints, laws of causality, or reality. Despotic genii are introduced, or the, which is the plural of, uh, of uh, a genie, are uh, in, introduced and they just intervene at the convenience of the authors. So there are, uh, for instance, uh, when Branwell writes the death of me, uh, Mary Percy into the book, one of um, uh, Zamorna's pining uh, lovers, Charlotte Bronte resurrects her. So what you have is that events can be retracted, dead can be resurrected and so on and so forth. And so what you have is uh, characters who are freed from all kinds of intellectual and moral responsibilities. And what they um, actually uh, end up doing is turning the romance into simple wish fulfillment. Now, as we know, and as Northrop Fryer reminds us, romance cannot simply involve wish fulfillment any more than tragedy can merely involve a fall. So tragedy is a structured fall, and we may think of romance as a structured wish. So if romance loses its structure, it simply becomes a cycle of desire and gratification. And at that point, it collapses into primitive fantasy. So uh, Bronte then, working with uh, the Angrian tales from the time, and the Angrian tales are called juvenilia, although she is writing them even when she is 22. Um, in very minute handwriting, uh, because Patrick Bronte would not have approved of the content of a lot of the juvenilia, but since his eyesight was poor, he could not read what Charlotte Bronte was writing. Um, so in this minute script, uh, all the four uh, of them actually, the um, collaboration between Anne Bronte and Emily Bronte is the Gondol Saga, uh, between Branwell Bronte and Charlotte Bronte is the Angrian Saga. Um, what you see then is the steady way in which when um, constraints of law and punishment of logic and causality are removed, uh, the characters lose, if you like, their psychological uh, complexity, personal restraint. But gradually, these characters grow. And um, rather than having a gratification of desire, you have, for instance, um, the emergence of a psychological complexity, typically, of course. Uh, this complexity begins among the women. Um, these women all pine for Zamorna. Um, they are, and Zamorna re resembles, Roche or rather Rochester resembles Zamorna in very important ways. And uh, they are thrust into a, the, uh, Zamorna has a series of adulterous love affairs from which he emerges unscathed. But scores of beautiful, beautiful and broken-hearted mistresses are littered on the landscape and they you know, are ever loyal to him. They're totally reduced and they pine hopelessly. So the heroines then are defined by their loneliness and desolation. And uh, sometimes, um, um, Mina Lori, for instance, says, Sometimes when she was alone of an evening walking through a handsome drawing room by twilight, she would long, she would think of home and long for home till she passionately cried at the conviction that she would see it no longer. Nobody constrains these women. These women are constrained themselves or they constrain themselves by their, they are constrained by their longing. They are constrained by the lack of self-esteem and their dependence on these cruel men who desert them very casually. Um, but there is one idea, says uh, Mina Lori, for instance, Zamorna, Zamorna. So what you have then is a, a kind of a, this, the structural simplicity of this world becomes a cyclical repetition of uh, incidents involving um, desperate masochistic women, submissive women, and omnipotent masochist, uh, uh, sadistic men. 
But as we know, it is only when desire fails to secure its immediate fulfillment that psychological complexity actually begins. And then at a certain point, um, Branwell and Charlotte Bronte fall out. And when she goes off to Rowhead, he writes part of the Anglian tales on his own because they are no longer uh, you know, physically together. And uh, she's furious at what he's done. He kills off uh, characters and so on and so forth. So she then, and also reduces the role that women play. So then there is a split in this collaboration and Charlotte Bronte takes over the writing of the Angry and Tales and writes them in her own way. So, although the professor is published posthumously, posthumously, that's her first novel, but it is a novel with a male protagonist. So I'm not going to look at that in, in great detail. Uh, but the second novel, and the one that actually launched her as an, a novelist is of course Jane Eyre. And um, what you um, find in Jane Eyre is uh, you know, something very important. But before I go to that, a set of very important uh, developments, least of which is the emergence of the, the uh, female voice. Now, um, Even till the end of her writing um, career, she didn't, barring her um, fragment, uh, which we don't know how it would, would have ended, but um, she never revised her belief in the destructiveness of male sexuality. She retained it. But what becomes clear is that romantic love is no longer the only center of her fictional world. There is another very urgent second concern, and that is the pursuit of individual autonomy. Um, so the complication in uh, heteronormative, uh, heterosexual relations, as she sees them, uh, one of the complications in that is the presence and the um, compelling presence of the need for individual autonomy. Like Carla, Charlotte Bronte also envisaged um, the Victorian as a destitute pilgrim. And just a short footnote here, as you know, uh, you know um, the questions of doubt and faith that were raised um, again and again um, within uh, essays and within poetic uh, po po or works of poetry and within other kinds of tracts, and in fact novels as well, um, situate the Victorian as this um, destitute pilgrim. Um, when the question of life after death becomes an impossible question to answer, uh, the, the notion of time also gets increasingly more urgent and uh, as conceptions of time itself change. Um, but the idea then of, uh, you know, the end, what is the end? How do we conceptualize the end? Um, and uh, I will now, you know, sort of um, take up three things. One is the question of the voice, but not necessarily in that order, but three things. One is the question of the voice and the, I'll introduce these three things and take them up in some detail. One is the question of the voice. The other is the question of de desire in narrative. And finally, I will actually pick up the question of uh, imperialism and how to uh, think of it in the context of these uh, novels. Now, from her childhood, the, the, this kind of, you know, um, the idea of metaphysical loneliness, which is so uh, central to Victorian times is very central to the novel as well. So you have the idea um, of Jane as completely stranded. But not just Jane, Lucy Snow gradually sort of becomes, gets abandoned. Now, um, metaphysical loneliness, while it is a terrible thing, it is also designated as a necessary condition for self-discovery, for freedom, for autonomy. So from her childhood onward, I just take the example of Jane here. From her childhood onward, she struggles to narrate her own story. Um, 
to explain herself. You might want to hyphenate that, to vindicate her life, to exercise her voice in, a, in participation, as she says, in the joyous conversational murmur. But she is, on the other hand, silenced. And she's silenced for some time. And then at a certain point, she says, um, I will speak. I must speak. And she speaks. She speaks to Mrs. Reed. She speaks to Brocklehurst. She speaks to a number of, she speaks out. Uh, in, in that, she is quite different from Helen Burns, who doesn't speak from Miss Temple, who becomes almost statuesque in her attempt to control her feelings that even a chisel would not pry her lips open. Jane speaks. Now, the idea of a speech is linked very closely to self-narrativization. It is the desire to narrativize oneself. And uh, the desire to narrativize oneself involves necessarily uh, the need for a dialogue with the other. So you have both self-narrativization and dialogue with the other. Um, because our self sense of identity is crucially tied up to our dialogical relations with others. We do not exist in isolation of that. And therefore the necessity of speech and the necessity of a dialogue kind of speech. Uh, so in fact, um, to be shut out, Jane says, to be isolated when she's locked up in the red room and then subsequently also, she says, oh my God, this isolation is banishment from my kind. And what you have then is um, being shut out of human dialogue, to be silenced, isolated, and, sp and uh, being spoken for or spoken of by others is to be denied identity and being. And Bhaktin reminds us of the importance of uh, this the need for dialogic interaction. Um, the second uh, thing that we uh, need to bear in mind is that even though one may acquire, um, may overcome silence, do you find an act, let alone an ideal listener, so when we think about the listeners, we think about the listener uh, with in counteracting the coercions and exclusions of the public sphere and the difficulties of the private sphere. Or in other words, do you have the kind of listener that you want? Um, so we say then that um, in Jane Eyre, the quest for an ideal lover, which is so much in the uh, angry entails is recast um, involves a recasting Jane Eyre involves a recasting of the classic romantic quest which conventionally promises a happy ending by the time you come to Villette the possibility of the happy ending is strangely the absence of the lover uh, and the consolidation of the idea that uh, the heteronormative uh, sexual relation cannot be a space that women can occupy along with their autonomy and remain autonomous at the same time. Um, so you have then um, the idea of um, the voice and the voice actually um, in search of the erotics of what we, we think of as the erotics of completion. Um, uh, completion or conjoinment is always an erotic uh, impulse, bears within it an erotic impulse. We think about the erotics then of completion, completion of the self, completion of the self with the other, in whatever ways in which one, uh, uh, you know, phrases this. Um, so, Let's just, having said this, that there is a desire for completion, let us quickly go over um, the scope of the term desire as it is being deployed for the purposes of this presentation. The first proposition and the first general proposition about desire is that it is actually a language that all men and all women speak. 
is a proposition. It is not a fact. It is simply stated here propositionally. Unstated. It's an unstated assumption that I understand this because I understand the same. I, I speak, if you like, the same language of design. So um, in order to be knowable, how are our desires knowable? The assumption there is that our desires are unknowable, are knowable because they all conform to a sexual model, uh, to a sorry, conceptual model. And it is only by that conformity to a, uh, to a conceptual model that you and I both understand that our dyes, desires become no. That's the first uh, presumption that is made sometimes, uh, well, often. Uh, the fact of the matter is that desire has no single stable meaning. It is, it, it can range from uh, the that which is essentialist in character to that which is, or, or from an essentialist understanding to a structuralist understanding of it. And you have Lacan and so on, you know, going with the structuralist understanding of design. Now, design is sometimes seen as a creative force aligned with eros or life instincts, an energy that fuels our most basic projects in the world, including narrative. In other words, Desire is a mover of narrative. Whether this is the narrative of one's life or a fictional narrative, it is the mover and not to say that narratives about one's life are not are, uh, you know, non-fictional necessarily, but certainly um, the, all the principles of narration that begin to operate uh, um, during the narration of the life and operate equally in narration of fictions. Um, so what you have then is um, the idea that desire is a creative force and that it generates narrative. Um, views that oppose this are that a state that, and this includes Lacan, that desire is inherently insatiable. It is simply a restless search for an absent object. So the desire for narrative is also the desire for an end. It is also the desire for a beginning. It is also the desire for a middle. In opposition to this, you have the understanding that actually desire is something um, that can simply cannot ever despite. It is simply a displacement of an, of an energy that continues, uh, you know, on and on. Teresa de Loritius, she attempts to historicize the concept. And uh, despite, you know, um, uh, her attempts actually fails, but, um, she addresses, for instance, uh, the understanding that um, there are two understandings. One is that uh, narrative is a processual thing. It is not a structure in itself, but it is a, pr a process. And we constantly need to plot our experiences along, the along, uh, those along certain set of lines which actually um, generate narrative without which those events cannot be uh, comprehended. So what uh, someone like Peter Brooks, for instance, maintains is that without narrative, you cannot comprehend the world. Um, and any kind or experience for that matter, everything is reliant on this. Now, for um, uh, Hillis Miller and Jonathan Culler and so on, you know, um, the text is constantly deconstructing itself. And therefore, um, you know, it's, it's revealing its incoherence, in other words. So there is no coherent uh, narrative that is established, but rather uh, the idea of incoherence that is established by scholars like Jonathan Culler and so on, the deconstructionists, basically, Hillis Miller and so on. But um, 
um, the the essentialist understanding, and it's an important one because it says it uh, says that all narratives. I mean, and it really depends on the scope of, of uh, which narrative one is looking at. Uh, all narratives are constrained by time. All narratives deal with time. The question is, are you dealing with rectilinear time that goes from point A to point B, point C, D, et cetera, and then ends somewhere, but, or whether you're deal dealing with cyclical time. Now, irrespective of whether you're dealing with one or the other, the fact is that the human uh, drama, if you like, and the individual drama is always in media stress, always. This is Frank, what Frank Kermode, for instance, argues, that it always starts somewhere in the middle and it ends also somewhere in the middle. So the notion of an ending is a very, very interestingly complicated one in the context of this. There's a constant deferment then of possibility of ending. So uh, or, or where it is, where you know, um, one ends. One begins in the media stress, or one is born in the middle. One dies in the middle. Uh, in the case of uh, certain um, lo lots of um, uh, women novelists' endings, one is married, and then there is silence after that. You do not know what post-marital speech would be like. We've given just a hint of it in Jane Eyre. In Villette, uh, in, Villette, in uh, Shirley, uh, Shirley is reduced to silence by the end of the novel after her marriage to uh, Robert, uh, Louis Moore. And she keeps referring everything to him. She who was, you know, is this passionate uh, uh, woman who's a professional, who runs factories. Um, is reduced to silence. And in Villette, of course, she then is uh, abandoned and she sees abandonment as actually uh, something constructive. So there is the eternal deferment of uh, the ending uh, with Villette, Paul may never return, marking either the deferment of desire that maybe he will return one day and the desire that that particular metonym of desire may be fulfilled or the nature of desire itself has changed. That is, one desires solitude. One desires to be. One desires the absence of uh, one, um, of, of the loved one. Um, and so you see then, uh, to come back to um, Loritas, um, Loritas says that, well, um, a, desire is always displaced and deferred. B, um, it is founded on an originary absence. That absence can never be, ever be fulfilled and therefore it will always be deferred. Um, C, very often, um, the articulation of desire or rather the theorization of desire is also in a, it uses the male sexual paradigm. So what um, um, Loritas does is that she um, goes closer to somebody like Bersani, for instance, in his understanding that um, narrative is actually pernicious. Because what uh, the sense-making orders of the uh, narrative, if you like, or, or narrative itself is rigidly linear, it's goal-oriented, it's single-minded, and it's intrinsically hierarchical. It promotes passivity among the reader. And it encourages us to isolate and immobilize privileged scenes within the narrative. In other words, because um, narrative is the culture's principal way of imposing meaning, it is a pernicious thing. So, um, so you have, uh, you know, Loritas saying that, well, yes, narrative is a pernicious thing, and, but goes on to say that what one needs to think about is the ways in which narratives are gendered. Um, 
with this little section, I'll close uh, this discussion on design and move to a more textual kind of analysis. Um, now, Luritas uh, understands that um, the subject has to be historicized, number one. So when you think about the narrator or you think about a character or a protagonist or what have you, you're thinking about a gendered self as much as, uh, well, not so much class, caste or race, racialized self, but in her context, she's thinking about a gendered self. It is Spivak who brings up the question of in, you know, um, uh, the racialized self in relation to narrative about, uh, among other people. But uh, the work of narrative for Deloritis is neither cognitive nor repressive, but it is one that produces the distinction between um, uh, gendered distinctions. That's the chief distinction it produces. And she goes on to argue that say in narrative, in, in narrative, uh, in work on narratives like Vladimir Propp's, Yuri Lockman and so on, um, she says, and even Levi Strauss, she says that all of them represent the male mythical hero, the mythical hero as male. It is, does not matter if that person or protagonist is in fact morphologically female. But the desiring subject is always represented as male or masculine, we would say. Um, secondly, um, the space or the obstacle, whatever its personification, is always feminine. I'd given an example in a lecture I delivered recently on uh, the ways in which, for instance, um, the appropriation of land and uh, of uh, femininity are central to the, Maha to the Ramayana. Um, Ravan must be displaced from his, uh, well, must be defeated or that uh, Topos must be conquered as much as Sita regained. So you have the understanding then of both of Topos itself as inherently feminine or um, and personified as such. And therefore the human subject is always considered male and the obstacle, whatever, is simply morphologically female and therefore, you know, sometimes conceived of simply as a womb. Um, and so what needs to be done is that in order for the hero or the protagonist to be successful, he must overcome um, the um, feminized topos. Now, um, I wanted to just, you know, think of this in terms of Jane Eyre as a text. Is it possible for us to see Jane in some ways? I mean, these are simply now I'm thinking aloud and setting out, you know, some possible speculative speculations around the text. Um, we see Jane as both a mythical human and therefore as masculine protagonist subject. Morphologically, she is female, but as masculine, feminine, uh, a masculine protagonist who must overcome uh, what, what the obstacle, which is feminized. Now the obstacle, when we think about the obstacle, then what do we think about? It's, you know, um, it's a very uh, provocative speculation that I'm offering. Um, what is it that Jane has to overcome? She has to overcome these uh, representatives of patriarchy. There's John Reed in the very beginning with his active kind of cruelty. Before that, Mina Laurie and uh, Mary Percy have to overcome Zamorna and Zamorna is sadistic, irresistible, but sadistic. Uh, you have Brocklehurst who has all the social powers accumulated, uh, who has accumulated a huge, a huge amount of social power and is himself a cruel man. You have Rochester who's irresistible, but somewhere, uh, you know, uh, both indifferent to uh, the question of female autonomy and indifferent to the idea of sexual equality. 
Um, and so you have these, you have John Rivers, who is, uh, you know, an emblem of religious uh, authority. You have all of these figures on the one hand, and you have Bertha Mason on the other. Now, typically, as every pilgrim does, Jane travels, and she progresses from point A to point B to point C and point D, and that's from Gateshead and, you know, um, with the... Um, shift away from primitive fantasy, you come down to the buildings Roman, where Jane goes from um, um, a, a space of denial to one of supreme consolidation that registers her growth. Um, but so you have a change in the form itself from fantasy, you move to uh, the, the realism of the buildings Roman. Uh, you have the character traveling and undertaking this journey that is both literal and metaphorical. And in the course of that journey, encountering a number of obstacles, which you must, of course, triumph over. We're familiar with this narrative. Uh, we're familiar with this trajectory. What complicates it is the fact that um, both uh, of, of course, um, like um, Lucy Snow, first of all, the, the heteronormative matrix is not a satisfactory one. So you have that one, the, that one complication. However, Jane Eyre ends in marriage, but it ends in marriage to a man who, who has been understood to be symbolically castrated. So is there a reversal is my question. To what extent can we understand a certain reversal in positionality taking place um, within the plot between Rochester and Jane Eyre? Given the fact that Bertha Mason, now Bertha Mason was understood, you know, <coughs> quite um, explicitly both as character and as doppelganger. She is Jane's other as much as she is a character in her own right. Uh, but that has always been, a, I think the influential reading of Gilbert and Guga sort of rendered that uh, as almost a normative reading of her as um, doppelganger of Jane or symbolic uh, self, uh, symbolic of uh, an aspect of herself. If you go back to the point I began with, self-articulation becomes a very important way of actually establishing one's being. Um, in the red room, you have uh, Jane seeing someone in the mirror. Just before her marriage, she sees Bertha in the mirror. Uh, she, th that someone in the mirror, of course, that she sees in the red room is she herself. She simply doesn't recognize herself. This unrecognizability of this other, the other within oneself, uh, is, you know, on the one hand, a very in interesting way in which um, Bronte establishes the duality of the protagonist. And rather than seeing a rationally self-interested individual that is presumed within liberal political theory, um, or the self-contained and the independent, what you have instead is the divided subject that is unknown to itself. So one might say that the project of knowing oneself or Jane knowing herself will be continuously ongoing. And it is a realization that Villette actually has. And she will remain for that reason single till to, to the end of the novel. Um, the second uh, thing to think about is that Bertha Mason is described very often as, she's described as an animal. She's described as large. She's described as crazy. She's described as violent. Um, she's described as the other of Rochester as much as she is described as the other of Jane. She is both this and that. So in terms of her symbolic location, um, Jane, uh, sorry, Bertha in fact figures not just as point of contact between uh, Rochester and Jane, but interestingly, 
um, as, as someone who can be harnessed by both. Now, um, Rochester harnesses Bertha, quite literally, for financial gain. It is the money of the colonies that's coming in, enriching him. He is the second son who has no inheritance, so he marries for money. He simply is, that's what he does. He marries um, Bertha for money, uh, gets her money, and then finds, he tells us um, that, you know, servants didn't listen to her. Uh, she didn't know how to speak in company and she was sexually uh, promiscuous and he made some kind of uh, rather sleazy remark uh, about uh, her possibly having got syphilis. And then she was, she, is genet uh, she was hereditarily prone to madness and he locks her up. For Jane, now, Jane is, well, I should say Charlotte Bronte allows Jane to harness Bertha on the one hand as that which will allow for this explosion of power whenever needed, and on the other hand will allow Jane to remain uh, this um, pale, um, rational, moral being. When she runs away from Rochester, after she gets to know about his marriage, she doesn't run away because, uh, you know, she's appalled, she's, you know, she sees evil and she can't take the better side of it. She runs away to preserve herself. So there's an enormous amount of self-preservation in Jane. But through that, I think Charlotte Bronte allows us to consolidate the idea of Englishness itself. So the presence of Bertha, as much as uh, the continued, um, presence of Bertha Mason as this um, wild, uh, crazy, um, irrational, uh, violent person allows for the moral consolidation of Jane Eyre. So, so if you think of it in terms of uh, investment, uh, Charlotte Bronte's investment in uh, the idea of imperialism, it's, it's quite intense. There is an intense investment in it, whereby the uh, now elevated protagonist uh, may consolidate empire as much as she consolidates herself and femininity. So, so, so you have uh, the, the novel doing an enormous amount of work um, in terms of, uh, you know, what it does for, um, um, the idea of female autonomy. Jane grows, goes from an orphan to someone who has family and not just family, but family who are dependent on her. She go, grows, uh, goes from uh, a penniless orphan to a rich woman. She has possibly more money than Rochester by the end of the novel. Um, and she she remains through all of this, the moral center of the novel. There's only one point at which, you know, this is jeopardized, which is when she returns to Rochester. She hears that voice, you know, calling her Jane, Jane, and she says, I will come or, um, or I'm coming or something like that. And she runs back to him. At that point, she has no idea that uh, Bertha Mason is dead. That is one, you know, some people have sort of read it as the kind of um, intense relationship between Rochester and Jane. I think one can also see it, read it as a return to a, a rather clumsy return to techniques that were employed in the juvenilia, where Jean and I just intervene and then things are reversed. Things just happen. Um, so it is then possible for me to say that given the extent to which Jane becomes representative of imperial Englishness, um, not quite in the way in which John Rivers is, uh, although she remains in touch with him and John Rivers eventually of course dies um, <clears throat> in, the, in, in India, comes to India and dies here. So she's not, she's um, as much interested in preserving herself as she is in becoming a voice for, or, or uh, featuring as, as much as she is 
featured as representative of England itself, Imperial England itself. So you have, I think, this very interesting tension within the novel where uh, uh, Bertha, uh, sorry, Jane is on the one hand um, autonomous, model voice, um, settled within a heteronormative matrix uh, within which she has achieved so much power that it is unlikely that she will be gendered as the weaker of the two. And uh, Jane at the same time as uh, the um, indiv strong individualistic, um, defined individ individualistic um, protagonist of Victorian literature. So uh, I think I'll just sort of um, uh, stop here and leave you know some of it just open for you to think about uh, whether these are questions of enclosure and escape, who escapes, who, is, who remains enclosed. And of course, I just refer very quickly to um, two things. One is that uh, the juvenilia already experiment with prototypes of Bertha. There is Kashia, Kamina, Kwamima, Kwamina, and there is Yuana in the professor. And they are both this kind of animalistic creatures, but they have they have different a different ending. Um, so um, and the second, of course, is uh, and I just want to close with a reference to uh, Jean Rhee's um, White Sargasso Sea, which uh, is an example of what happens to our understanding of Jane Eyre as a novel, in other words, the narrative of Jane Eyre, how it gets retrospectively compromised uh, through um, a reading of Jean Rees because uh, White Saga Associ, because White Saga Associ focuses on Bertha and Toinette in that novel, not as a plot device, but as a human subject. And once that happens, all these various themes begin to um, get qualified. So I'll stop with this and uh, maybe we can have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, for such a uh, rich and complex presentation today. If I understood it right, on the one hand, you tried to look at the theoretical propositions about desire to begin with and then female desire and how female desire, if we are to treat them within an autonomous space, it also has to include the very question of male desire as well. And yes. then within the heteronormative space, as you repeatedly were trying to suggest, that only there one can find the answer. And some of the endings of the novels, as you pointed out, that where women were almost trying to become quote unquote, even as if morphologically as men, right? And uh, on the other hand, and you also refer to the post-Freudian development in psychoanalysis and the studies in erotic ideas. This is one part of it. On another hand, you also uh, added up another dimension, which is quite in, if not opposite, at a different tangential, that's the historical perspective of the emergence of the new figure of woman who is yeah. more bound by the subjugation of the men. And as the so-called, if I may use this word, uh, audacity to represent herself as the representative of the empire, right? Because uh, if we remember when uh, Charlotte Bronte is growing up, these are the years when Victoria as queen is yeah. also taking up as the empire, uh, precisely, I think, 1837 onwards, right? And her novels are also coming in 1840s, and she's writing till 1850s, four of her novels that you made a mention of. And that perhaps allows the woman to enjoy and dominate her isolation, right? And it is, as you said, that isolation is one of the uh, uh, preeminent qualities or necessary conditions for exercising one's self-eroticisms, one's fantasies. And you also said fantasy can happen once a desire is somewhere or the other broken because with desire, you still have the wish for a fulfillment, but with fantasy, there is no sense immediate. There is no sense of immediacy of the desire and mm. So I really enjoyed uh, your delivery today and I was thoroughly following this. And I hope there are quite a few questions are coming on your way. The first question has come. Uh, can the book be called as a work of feministic approach? Which book are you referring to? Is it Jane Eyre? I think so. I, I, 
suppose it should be. Yeah. I suppose it is Jane Eyre. Um, well, uh, you know, reading it now in the 20th century, I mean, I don't know if Charlotte Bronte herself would have called it a, a feminist uh, kind of work, but I think, yes, it, it is quite safe um, to think about um, um, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre as a work, uh, as a feminist kind of text or a feminist tract in some senses. Uh, both because of some of the, the uh, remarks that Chashuk has always already made in his uh, uh, concluding uh, the statements he made just now. Um, Jaina is elevated in different ways and uh, allowed to occupy, occupy different positions which were otherwise not permitted to women, which were very difficult for women to actually uh, attain to. So uh, in that sense, um, you know, the, and the kind of narrative space that is actually laid out for Jane uh, is a bold kind of move for any uh, woman writer at that time, and particularly a woman writer writing about um, um, uh, other women. Now, the female protagonist in particular, for instance, Matthew Arnold, when he remarked on um, Jane, uh, on Villette actually, he said, uh, that, you know, Charlotte Bronte is full of rage and rebellion. So is Jane. And the portrayal of this um, um, character as one who is rebellious, as one who's raging, as one who's sexually uh, aware in some ways, she's virginal, no doubt. But she's very clear that, you know, she wants to have a, a, a certain a, a sexual partner at some point. She's very clear about that who's savvy, who's rational, and who is the moral center of the, the book. And because she is the moral center of the book, um, for the, I think um, very importantly, the onus, uh, typically the onus of morality was on women, but ma men made all the moral uh, you know, um, rules. Here, Jane actually sets uh, sets up the agenda, the moral agenda. So it's very unusual to see a, a, a female protagonist as a central, as also the moral center of, of the book. So uh, that kind of, I mean, the way in which, uh, you know, Charlotte Bronte eases Jane into this, uh, you know, position of uh, authority and uh, consolidation is what, you know, uh, we would say makes her um, makes us think of it as a feminist text. But you know there are kinds. I just want to uh, take two minutes more, Shashwata, and just say that uh, you know there are kinds and kinds of feminism also. So, for instance, uh, White Saga Associates is also a response to uh, Jane, Eyre, where you know um, the idea of uh, race and black feminism and you know post-coloniality, all of these, which are, all have their own kinds of feminism. Post-colonial criti critiques of Jane Eyre, for instance, would say that, well, uh, Charlotte Bronte was fundamentally imperialist in her approach. But uh, also qualify that by saying that at the same time, you know, there is space that is given. So I would say yes, but just also focus on uh, the aspects of post-coloniality and uh, imperialism in the novel. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you are talking about a text, a text yes. can be open to any kind of uh, critical inquiry, right? So it's yes. not just a feminist text or a post-colonial text. It's just at that particular moment when we are discussing certain questions or issues, then we are trying to connect the text with those issues, right? So, yeah, we have a question from Minakshi Malhotra. Uh, she is asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, she has a question. Could you comment a bit on the link between Zamorona and Rochester? Can you find traces of Zamorona in Hipcliff also? I, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think even though, uh, you know, the um, Bronte children shared their work. But they were also very private and very, uh, you know, um, 
uh, protective of the uh, work. But there was a lot of conversation, a lot of intervening. So I think, yes, um, the Byronic hero uh, is something that enthralled all of them. So I would respond to the question in terms of the, the uh, presence and influence of, of the Byronic hero on both, in both these texts. So you have, uh, and, and that is also comes from their, uh, from, you know, it's manifest in the self-fashioning of Branwell Bronte himself as, uh, you know, sort of uh, a figure of excess. Um, I think also both Charlotte Bronte and uh, mm, Emily Bronte were dealing with, uh, you know, really things that lay outside the scope of gen what, what you think of as the genteel. Quite different, say, from Jane Austen. So they were willing to go where, uh, you know, few women went, were willing to go uh, before. So I, I think that um, Zamorna and Rochester, very close links, but Rochester, of course, the distinction between Rochester and Zamorna is that um, Rochester is brought to his knees in a sense. Uh, Zamorna is never, he's not. Um, so I think I, that should, uh, yep. my response. Uh, yes, yes, yes. In fact, I was uh, just thinking about this uh, residue or the aftermath of this great romantic movement. Mm. Because romanticism itself celebrates this isolation and yeah. And it is no coincidence that the uh, early phase of capitalism in Europe also coincided with the romantic movement. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that liberates the individual. I mean, it is yeah. of the gender or class. That was the hope, but that created a continental desire of an individual to yes. be bigger than which was given, right? Yes. Right? And novels that way fits precisely at that historical juncture when mm -hmm. women who are otherwise subaltern twice or thrice can have those dreams, right? And that's a very interesting thing. However, there's a nice question, Jagriti Upadhyay. Uh, she says that how do you visualize Bertha, Englishness and imperialism in wild sargas of sea? I mean, which is later... What's the question again? How does? Yes. Uh, how do you uh, do we visualize Bertha Englishness and imperialism in wide Sargasso Sea, right? So. Well, uh, you know, I mean, the interesting thing about uh, Bertha is that she is um, white Creole. And in her relation to Tia, for find that, you know, there is a remarkable um, scene where she's, she goes and she runs uh, runs to meet Tia when they're both young. She runs to go meet Tia and Tia throws a stone at her. And she says that, you know, the blood on my face was mirrored by the tears in her eyes. And you have there, I think, uh, this, uh, the separation between Tia, who's a native, and uh, Bertha, who's a white Creole, the separation between them becomes then very, very clear. So uh, uh, I think Rees makes that um, a distinction apparent to us that Bertha is, you know, sort of white Creole. And uh, in her encounter with Rochester, of course, um, um, Rees is quite explicit that uh, Rochester is, uh, you know, somebody who has absolutely no understanding of uh, I mean, the power equations between them are so um, uh, unequal that um, she is, she becomes, a, you know, a subordinate representative of a colony. And um, I think it's also interesting, important to understand that he's also because it is, you know, um, uh, Rochester as a man. Rochester is more free ranging, wide ranging is in, in terms of his movements and what he can and can't do. And uh, eventually um, he, he sort of um, renames her Bertha 
that's not her name. Her name is Antoinette. And she keeps asking me why, asking me why she, he calls her Bertha. And my name is Antoinette, but he doesn't give her any account for this. Uh, account of this. So you have, I think, it as um, uh, the the relation between the two of them as a very finely drawn comparison between uh, the dominant empire or the dominant imperial self and uh, the subordinate subaltern, uh, colonized one, and um, it's it's a gradual process. It doesn't. It's not something that is established right away, but she's gradually worn out and she's gradually worn down and he gradually ascends. So that kind of ascendancy, which you see, for instance, uh, in characters like um, William Bradshaw, so their ascendancy uh, is tremendous. And then they stand above in dominion over other people. So um, I think, you you know, that's one way to, to understand uh, your... Um, right. Actually, why Sarada you see that novel particularly also brings forth some of the uh, historical uh, disagreeable facts or not so spoken about facts, yes. Yes. And that's where he speaks more and more about the colonial uh, inner yes. process, which went hushed up or silence during the time. We have a textual question from Ajanta Dutt. Uh, she says, the fire, the burning, is that Bertha's destroyed desire? I'm sorry, what was that again? Uh, the, Shash fire, the fire, no. the burning, is that Bertha's destroyed desire? Hmm. You know, there are, there are a few observations. Uh, we are told that Bertha burns place down. But, uh, you know, uh, given the lopsided nature of the narrative around Bertha, one is left wondering uh, whether it is Bertha who burns Thornfield down or and then jumps to her death or if it is actually yeah Bertha maybe burning Thornfield down but maybe not jumping to her death maybe just sort of being pushed to her death we don't know uh, there, there is that exists as a possibility only because uh, you know Rochester's narrative about Bertha becomes so suspect in a post-colonial context. Now, uh, is Bertha's, the, the fire, the burning out of Bertha's desire, I mean, Bertha desires to go home, actually. She doesn't desire anything more than that. And um, uh, if one were to think of the, uh, of death as, you know, a fine, sort, sort of final uh, passage, uh, ho you know, homeward passage, then, you know, perhaps you can see it as uh, the fulfillment of a desire. But um, I think that Bertha's wanderings through Thornfield, Bertha's engagement with fire, I mean, has, is also, um, uh, must also be read in symbolic terms as a manifestation of, uh, you know, sort of Jane's desires. Um, and her desire for Rochester, of course, is growing stronger and stronger as her distance from him increases. And that's why I said, you know, in my um, argument that Bertha is the one who eventually joins them, actually. Even as she's the one who separates them, she's the one who eventually actually joins them because it is through, uh, or, or rather over the body of Bertha that actually this transaction, this exchange between um, Jane and Rochester can be made. So, um, I would say, yes, it is, In if you look at it as, in those terms, in the terms in which I suggested earlier, it is kind of fulfillment of uh, Bertha's desire. But uh, otherwise, I think it is more fulfillment of Jane's desire and of Rochester's desire, um, achieved over the body of Bertha Mason. So, uh, Professor uh, Krishna Nuni, he has a long question to ask. I'll read it slowly. In the clash between the domestic silence and the public silence, the women of Bronte seem to create some ethical stance as their private is more imperialized and political. How do we look at this clash in the more nuanced question of women at large, within quotes, in the context of 19th century? 
Can you read the question again, please? Uh, uh, I think in a very simple way, he is yeah. trying to ask that the private space of a woman is very, very private. And then on the other hand, we have the women at large, like the general figure of the women, the general presence yeah. of the women. So how yeah. these two things come together? But there is a women and also the private space. Right. Well, in the I, mean, I mean, I think we're thinking of private space in, in so many ways. Uh, one can think of the private space in terms of a, a, a private sphere separated from the public sphere. And, uh, you know, also uh, the private space as, as uh, you know, the inter as interiority. So these are the two look, uh, you know, just let's just take these two. So uh, in terms of um, you know, women at large, there, there is, as uh, we know, George Moore, I think, said it, always a separation between women and wages, never a separation between women and work. So women were visible. So that's the interesting thing. Women were very visible in the Victorian times, uh, not just as cheap labor, but also, you know, um, uh, moving around the place and as migrants and so on and so forth. So you have a large number of women moving around in um the thing is that um, this visibility of women actually presents a problem. And the, the, the kind of problem it is presented gets is something that gets taken care of ideologically um, and materially. Ideologically, it gets taken care of in terms of the split between, you know, within the woman, the duality of women, that a woman can be either this or that, she cannot be the two something that Charlotte Bronte, of course, reverses. And when women can be this and that, both together. Uh, but so there is in the uh, ideological, ideologically, even the most public of women, like Florence Nightingale, for instance, who was to whom every matter pertaining to um, the medical institutions and hospitals were referred to. And she was a woman with a very short temper and she refused to marry. But she was domesticated eventually as the lady with the lamp, as the angel, in, you know, another angel in the house. So there were ideological ways of confining women, uh, returning them to the private sphere. Uh, the um, other, in terms of interiority, I think that's also a very interesting uh, sort of um, issue. Um, Karen Chase in, you know, Eros and Psyche, she talks about the way in which um, Gothicisms and the Gothic actually become, and you know, spaces, interior spaces, become ways of actually representing interiority. And um, the closer, the smaller, and the more interior the space, the greater the uh, energy within it. So, in typical kind of Gothic. Uh, set up, you would have, you can just take Thornfield, for example, you have floor one, floor two, floor three, and on floor three things are happening. There are, you know, strange, uh, monotonous laughter and, um, you know, um, pattering of feet, screams, and so on and so forth. But within, you know, um, uh, within that, in Villette, for instance, you have letters within a box kept within a desk, a drawer in a desk, uh, which is locked and so on and so forth. And the, the um, further you go, more, the, the greater your access to that which is concealed, the greater the energy that is released. So um, I think women were also finding a way to express that which was supposed to be inexpressible. Whether, and this is really the question of desire. How does one express desire without being called out, for instance? Uh, it is something that um, Gabriel Dante Rossetti was very worried about when Christina Rossetti published The Goblin Market, for instance. Uh, and he, he didn't want her to be, well, slut shamed in a sense. Neither, neither did Bronte, her, um, Rossetti herself want her work with the uh, with prostitutes, the reformation of prostitutes, part of the Oxford movement, to come to light. So you have then, you know, the way in which private, the idea of private, is both notion of interiority, 
um, and to the notion of what cannot be expressed and what should not be actually, should not gain expression. Right, because you see, uh, if we closely study the architecture of the private houses in 19th century, then we would uh, come to know that how the inner room or the inner space itself was getting redefined. It was mm. like the houses, private houses, which were getting built, let's say 200 years back, which were rather too open and more inviting. Now, post neoclassical era, once you are done with the gardening and the haze and the maze, where people can <laughs> get lost, right? Then you are now making your houses, which are not big ones, but they can also make one lost in one's own privacy, right? Yes. And with the question of privacy, because desire is immediately linked with the question of privacy and the privacy of an individual, in fact, the whole discourse. Yeah. But in order to fulfill one's individual's desire, that privacy also has to be challenged, broken. Yeah. Right. And also unspeakable. Yes, unspeakable. But I have a, a small question before I read out someone else's. With the question of desire and privacy, also there is a question of guilt. Of oh. Guilt. Guilt, right. Because uh, as you know, when we were reading, let's say, a book which was written some 20 years back called uh, The Solitary Sex, fine, which mm. was the history of masturbation. And there, in order to explore that whole discourse, the author had to actually explore the question of guilt. Because with the question of guilt in the Jewish and the English and the British uh, yes. history, the Christian history, Christian tradition, yes. Yeah. Can one make an entry into the question of privacy or individual isolation and the fulfillment of uh, self-desire? So my question is that how does Jane Austen deal with this finer nuances or the differences and the gap between the guilt and the fulfillment of desire? Uh, right? Jane Austen or Charlotte Bronte? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no, Charlotte Bronte. I was, I was thinking when you were speaking, I was thinking of two things. One is the idea of the pilgrim. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, uh, despite all her uh, rage and rebellion, um, Charlotte Bronte is finally, of course, very, de very devout kind of Christian. She ends up, you know, marries also a clergyman in an unfortunate marriage, which results in her death uh, from childbirth, but uh, childbearing, actually. And um, so, you know, there is I think all of that um, uh, coming to bear on, uh, on on the idea of sexual expression um, and the question of desire. And I'm thinking not of desire not simply in sexual terms, but actually in desire for self um, uh, expression, the desire to you know be present rather than being absent. So. Uh, I think on the one hand, there is this immense commitment to a Carlylean kind of vision that she has, um, in which there is this abandoned self, uh, abandoned by God for whatever reasons, but this, uh, who must pilgrimage, uh, for, you know, undertake a pilgrimage to, and come to a point of eventual um, rest at the feet of God in his manner of speaking. Uh, you know, the... Uh, her passion um, with, um, you know, this, I mean, I think one way in which one has to think of it also is the separation of the Brontes during their childhood from uh, most things. And uh, the, the, the wild roamings on the moors, their readings, the, the father did, allowed them to read anything that was in his library and so on and so forth, that led to, and they were relatively brought themselves up. I think that also leads to, you know, results in a certain kind of um, um, intellectual orientation, which allows for, uh, you know, this surprising otherness um, in terms of uh, um, dealing with that, which in any case makes one feel guilty, you know? So um, I think that there is, of course, this tremendous guilt, but at the same time, there was uh, a, a, an intellectual energy that permitted them to engage with that guilt 
and I don't know if they necessarily felt it, but certainly it seems to be there, but allowed, allowed them to engage. So does that uh, address your uh, question, Shash? I think largely we are trying to look at different perspectives to enter into the discourse of a novelist who is uh, yeah, yeah. published and she's just- There's also this you know, method of the, the, the allusion. For instance, the technique of doubling, right. um, the uh, use of metaphor, rather than, you know, direct address. All of these are also ways of, um, you know, guiltless ways of uh, confronting uh, issues of this kind. So there are uh, quite a few other questions, but uh, we are running a little short of time. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you once more. I uh, hope oh. delivered and uh, enrich us with your observations on Charlotte Bronte and her novels and the entire time uh, that is mid 19th century. So it was wonderful that you had with us. And for our uh, viewers today, we have another talk coming up day after tomorrow by Professor Jonathan Gil Harris, who will be speaking on Shakespeare and the pandemic, six o'clock on Zoom. Uh, please uh, stay tuned to that. We'll share on social media the details. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Karen. Once again. Thank you very much, Shashwat, and thanks to this uh, absolutely wonderful uh, audience who and uh, set of listeners who've given such rich feedback, and to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you. You too.